Happy Monday, everyone. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. That's the show where we look into a case and what is the critical piece that solved that case for the authorities. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, today's case is it's historic uh, for a number of reasons. And um, that's all I'm going to say about it before we get started. A big thank you to Christy for writing this one up. This is one that I like to call the Loveless Outlaw. Du Bois, Idaho is a former railroad hub located on the eastern side of the state. This area of Clark County has fewer than 870 residents, but has been a popular tourist attraction for many years due to the volcanic caves nearby. Known as Buffalo Cave, the caves themselves were formed billions of years ago when lava cooled at 1,000 feet below the Earth's surface, forming the system of tunnels as we see them today. During the Cold War, the area was designated as bomb shelters, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the civil defense caves, as they were formerly known, became a destination for family fun. In August of 1979, a family was exploring the cave system in the hopes of finding Native American arrowheads when they dug into the sandy ground and found an oddly shaped burlap sack. When they opened the sack, they were shocked to find a male torso. Clad in a white shirt with blue pinstripes and a maroon sweater, it had been buried just 18 inches deep in a shallow grave. The Clark County Sheriff believed, based on the man's clothing, that he was probably a gambler from 60 years earlier, but the coroner believed that the man must have died within the last decade due to the odors that the body was still emanating. After investigating the area, police found nothing else, and with no way of identifying the man, the investigation very quickly stalled out. Twelve years later, in March of 1991, Lynette Rogers was exploring the cave system with her father and her children. As the family discussed the mysterious torso that had been found in those caves a few years prior, Lynette just happened to shine her flashlight across the cave floor. To everyone's shock, they were looking at a human hand sticking out of the soil. Police investigated the new area and found a set of arms, both of which bore traces of a red sweater and burlap bag. But that wasn't all. Officers also found a pair of legs stuck in a hole in the lava floor nearby. Investigators now believed they had the rest of the body that belonged to the torso found over a decade earlier, except the head which would prove to be far more elusive. The man's remains were first examined by forensic experts at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In the late 90s, a team at the Smithsonian would also take a look, as well as Idaho State University and the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Everyone's combined efforts helped to determine that the man's hair was probably reddish brown, he was around the age of 40 when he passed away, and he was of European descent. They believed that his body had been in the cave for at least six months and possibly as long as 10 years. They were unable to give a cause of death, although they were able to determine that his body was dismembered using a variety of sharp tools. In 2019, former researchers on the project reached out to Bingham Redgrave of the DNA Doe Project for assistance. DNA Doe Project is a nonprofit organization that uses genetic genealogy to identify John and Jane Doe's by using their DNA to find their family tree. Fourteen volunteer genealogists spent more than 2,000 hours researching the man's history. They found 31,730 individuals with similar markers, which prompted them to limit their research to 250 of the most promising candidates. On December 31st, 2019, they announced that they had narrowed their search down to just one man, a man named Joseph Henry Loveless. One of the things that drew researchers to Loveless was the fact that his gravestone was actually a cenotaph, a stone with his name on it, but no body buried underneath. And that cenotaph dated to 1916. Loveless was born to polygamous pioneers Joseph Jackson Loveless and Sarah Jane Scriggins Loveless in Payson, Utah on December 3, 1870. At the age of 28 in 1899, Loveless married Harriet Jane Hattie Savage in Salt Lake City and would have one child with her. But in 1904, Hattie filed for divorce. She claimed that Loveless had abandoned his family and refused to support them. The court granted her request. 
A year after the divorce, Joseph Loveless married Agnes Octavia Caldwell in Bear County, Idaho. Together, they had four children, but Loveless just couldn't stay out of trouble. He was arrested for bootlegging in 1913 and again in 1914, but was able to escape both times by sawing through the bars of his cell with a saw blade he hid in a compartment in one of his boots. In March of 1916, Loveless managed to stop a train that was escorting him to jail and escape, only to be recaptured and sent back to jail, where he escaped yet again. This guy missed out his calling. He really should have been a magician. He would use many aliases throughout the years, but two in particular, Walter Cairns and Charles Smith, would help catch him in the end. On the morning of May 5th, 1916, his wife Agnes was found by two of their children next to the tent that the family lived in on the outskirts of Du Bois. She was barely clinging on to life. Her head was described as nearly severed. Despite these injuries, it would take 50 hours before she would finally pass away. Loveless, who was nowhere to be found, became the prime suspect. But the couple had been living under the names Charles and Ada Smith. And when Loveless fled, he began using the name Walter Cairns. This made it much harder for police to track him down. A wanted poster was quickly issued, and just one week later, in nearby St. Anthony, the Pocatello Chronicle published an article stating that Joseph Loveless, using the name Walter Cairns, had been arrested for his wife's murder. One of his sons not only identified his father to investigators, but also warned that, quote, Papa never stayed in jail very long, and he'll soon be out. He was right. Soon after he was incarcerated, Loveless used his hidden saw blade to make his final escape and was never seen again. It's blown everyone's minds, Bingham Redgrave said of the investigation. The really cool thing, though, is that his wanted poster from his last escape is described as wearing the same clothing that he was found in. Loveless was 46 years old when he was killed, making his corpse 103 years old. Investigators don't know why Loveless was killed and buried in a cave 150 miles from where he disappeared, but they do have a theory. Shortly after he broke out of jail, Agnes's family came to town to retrieve her body for burial in the family plot. This means that they were in the area at the time that he disappeared. It's believed, one of the theories at least, is that her family took revenge on Loveless, dismembered him, and then hid his body as payback. Uh, authorities are unable to offer a picture of Loveless, but the DNA Doe Project was able to draw up a composite based on photographs of his immediate family members and the physical description on his wanted poster. The Clark County Sheriff's Office has stated that Loveless's case will remain open because investigators don't know who killed him. But they were able to notify one of his surviving relatives, an 87-year-old grandson. Loveless's descendants were unaware of their ancestors' criminal past, which leaves investigators without much more to go on besides speculation. Bingham Redgrave would go on to state, Who knows? Someone might recognize that name and say, Oh, let me look at the old family photos. Someone may find something, an old news story that isn't digitized. We'll probably never solve the homicide, but we still encourage anyone who has heard stories to contact us you never know what piece of information could help. The saw blade Loveless used in his many jail escapes has yet to be found, nor has his head. But despite that, this John Doe case is currently the oldest one ever solved using familial DNA. Case cracked. I would like to give a very big thank you to LawandCrime.com, The Guardian, Fox News, Metro.co.uk, The Media Times, The Washington Post, The New York Times, DNA Doe Project.org, Wikipedia, and People.com. Of course, a very big thank you to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up all this detail for us. But it certainly leaves me with a few questions. Of course, the big one, where is the head? And is that theory about the family really to explain for that? Is it that they, I don't want to say like, you know, took it as a keepsake or something like that, but maybe they separated it from the body because they didn't want him to be identified. 
But honestly, I'm not sure if the family theory really holds up for me either because of the distance traveled. Uh, 150 miles in those days, that's a lot of time that you're spending with a body if you're moving a body. Um, so I'm almost thinking that it might be more likely that he went on the run, uh, something else happened to him. Maybe someone did know he was a criminal and he got what was coming to him. Maybe it was something completely outside of that. Maybe he tried to rob someone and it went bad or something along those lines. I don't know. Uh, it's strange because the dismemberment thing does seem kind of personal, um, unless it was a method of moving him. Um, but yeah, a lot of questions when it, when it comes to that, it's, it's kind of amazing that they found everything else. And a really interesting aspect of that is that everything else was so well preserved that it was basically throwing off the analysts. I mean, you guys heard the dates that they were estimating, you know, six months to 10 years that he had been there in there. No, he was in there for decades. And even the one analysis about, you know, he couldn't have been in there that long because of the smells that he was emanating. Uh, I don't know if it was because it was the caves in particular. I don't know if there was just uh, some aspect of being in that type of environment that really preserved him uh, all that well. But that's just another kind of mind boggling aspect to this story because I do see that there can be variations in terms of um, the dates or how old they think someone is. Um, but to that degree, I haven't seen before. I've seen them be wrong by maybe 10 years or maybe 15 at the most. Um, decades, that's, that's a whole different story. And I just think about the family's aspect when, you know, his grandson and other family members are contacted so many years later and they don't even know these stories. They have no idea that their family member was a criminal. I mean, can you imagine a knock at your door and all of a sudden you're hearing a story like that? That had to be um, just really, I don't know if it's tough to deal with necessarily. I mean, I think all of us would have strange feelings if we heard that a family member was a criminal. Um, but I think just the shock of this information and all this history, it's, it's amazing that the Doe Project was able to piece all this together. Um, it's just, it's amazing what a good genealogist can do. And that really comes through in this story. Um, but Christy and I are a little curious have you guys ever had anything like that happen? Someone knock on your door and say, hey, remember that family member? Do you, do you know that they did this? If you feel comfortable sharing those with us, we'd really like to check them out. So please drop those in the comments down below. Um, I can't think of one. I kind of heard that my great grandfather might have been a money runner for Al Capone. Any of you guys have that story too? I don't know if that's just one of those popular ones that floats around, but let's hear yours in the comments. Uh, also, if you'd like to learn more and consider supporting the DNA Doe Project, you can do that by visiting dnadoeproject.org. And of course, I stopped by there earlier today and be on behalf of my amazing supporters on Patreon and PayPal, we have made a donation to the DNA Doe Project to help support their amazing work. I'd also like to give a very big thank you to PayPal supporters Hillary Green, Brandy Fry, and Jennifer Dixon for helping to keep me here doing what I love doing, spending time with you and looking into these sometimes amazing stories. And this one really, there's just so many aspects. I, I really mean it. This guy missed his calling. You know, he, he could have been the next Harry Houdini, I think. And uh, instead, he's the headless, loveless cowboy that was found. Take care, everyone. Hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for spending some time here on the Lord and Arts channel. Please come back on Wednesday. We'll have a brand new episode of Searchlight all ready for you. I hope to see you there. Yeah.